Hello guys, Charles here and welcome back to my channel. So we've established on this channel over the last several videos that really you can play chromatically over pretty much any chord in any context if you use the right devices and tricks. So really we're limited there to a maximum of 12 notes in the Western system. So there has to be more going on to make our music interesting and that's what we're going to be discussing today. Let's kick off with a quote from the man himself. I have always felt that having good time and good feel is far and away the most important aspect of what makes a musician compelling to listen to. It isn't fun to listen to or play with someone who doesn't groove. There are musicians who have all kinds of advanced harmonic fluency and lots of chops, but have a hard time playing a convincing idea with a deep connection to time. Without a deep pocket of some kind, it is rare that music achieves that kind of connection. To me, a note that is not placed right with the rhythm section or in the wrong context of the music that is being presented is the same as if it is a big giant clam, a wrong note. I hear people kind of letting it go as if it's fine to be way ahead or behind or all over the place. Step one is to be aware of how it is all feeling. Playing with a metronome or a drum machine or sequencer is a good thing, but the best is to play with other people who have good time feels, particularly drummers. It is certainly something that you can work on. Pretty much everyone at every level has plenty of work to do in this department, myself included. I found it really interesting that Matheny mentions the drums specifically at the end there. Uh, Michael Brecker also endorsed actually learning the drums in a masterclass which you can find on YouTube. But the drums are an instrument. I know that shouldn't be a shock, but the drums are an instrument and they create music. Therefore, it proves that we don't need notes at all in order to create music. So people will happily move and dance to the drums because we interpret it as music. So we need to get the rhythm down first and then all that's left are the 12 chromatic notes. Although there are only 12 notes, there are infinite rhythms. Now the specific topic of this video is counting. Now counting is not the same as rhythm, although they are very, very closely related. So a rhythm is the sound created by combining similar or different note lengths together. Counting is what's going on either in your head or in your body in order to feel and, and move your way through that rhythm. A good example would be thinking of a four beat note. A four beat note is not really a rhythm, it's just a single event. It would just go, La. But the count for a four beat note, there's a lot more going on. We would be going one, two, three, four. So the count is different. It had four events, whereas the four beat note was just a single sound. But as I say, these are very closely related. So the better your counting is, that leads to better timing and more accurate rhythms. So the main thing I want you to take away from today's video after we've gone through the method is that counting, timing, groove, feel, swing, dynamics, articulation and rhythm are all very, very closely related and how we manipulate each of those and work on them individually improves our whole sense of timing. And I want you to feel inspired to go away and work on your counting with your instrument and away from your instrument to improve your overall skills, including your technique, your time and your tone. Hal Galper recalled a week he spent playing with Dizzy Gillespie and he said this, you know how we get hung up in the top end of the music and the theory, the notes and all that stuff. He, Dizzy Gillespie, didn't mention the notes once in this whole week we were together and he was teaching all the time. All he talked about for the whole week was rhythm. Rhythm, rhythm, rhythm. And at one point he said, you know, some people think of a note first and put a rhythm to it. And some people think of a rhythm first and put a note to it. And then he walked away. So the way I explain rhythm and counting to my students is to think of a lattice up the side of a house and that lattice is the rhythm and the notes are the plants which will eventually grow up it. But without the lattice there in the first place, the plants don't have anything to grab onto. Now, don't do what I did, which is to work on your shredding, your technique, all of your deep music theory substitutions, chromatic concept stuff but never work on your rhythm. Because as Matheny said, there's lots of people who have those chops and they have their harmonic skills, but 
it doesn't really work unless you're playing with great time feel. So what I want you to do instead is focus entirely on rhythm and feel and any brain power that's left can be applied to your chops and your harmonic devices. If your time feel starts to suffer when you're using a certain chromatic device or you're thinking about uh, how fast you're playing and the time feel or the groove or the accents or any of the, that list of skills that we discussed before falls to pieces, then you need to tone it down. You're playing beyond your ability. So let me show you the really simple way that I introduce my students to the idea of counting and how it fits into rhythm and the whole musical framework. So using this chart, we're gonna visualize all of our available counts in a logical fashion. Now, just to clarify, what you say is unimportant. These are just the sayings I've always used, but of course, we're gonna be counting a number for the beats and the subdivisions, what's happening between the beats, you can use anything. Uh, some people use words, drink names, food names, it doesn't really matter. Uh, these are just the ones I've always used. So if we're counting one beat notes or greater, we simply use numbers and we say one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Easy peasy. So our second row is half beat notes or eighth notes. Now, all we're using to name that middle note that lands between the counts is and. So we're going to say one, two, three, four, one and two and three and four and. Simple as that. Next line, we've got triplets. Now, what I'm using for triplet is the letter P and L, which is tri per lut. So I'm saying one per lut, two per lut, three per lut, four per lut. So that gives me one, two, three, four, one and two and three and four and one per lut, two per lut, three per lut, four per lut. Finally, we're dividing into quarters, which is our 16th notes or semiquavers. Obviously, two quarters equals a half, so we're still going to use and to represent the half. And we're using the letter E to represent the second quarter and A to represent the final quarter. So that gives us one E and a, two E and a, three E and a, four E and a. In context, that would sound like this. One, two, three, four. One and two and three and four four and one per lut, two per lut, three per lut, four per lut, one e and a, two e and a, three e and a, four e and a. Okay, so we've got those four rows of counts. Now, of course, we're currently working in four, four time and just using four of the most common subdivisions, but you could extend this chart into fives, six, and you could add or remove beats to change the time signature. So how are you going to actually use this chart to improve your own timing? Because all we've done so far is spoken through it. Well, what we're going to be doing is, first of all, you need to make sure you're focusing on the strong beats. You're focusing on the numbers and the subdivisions should be quite throwaway. Now, that's kind of counterintuitive because really the difficult thing is placing those subdivisions, but they need to be really relaxed and natural. So really try and mentally focus on the strong beats, the numbers, and have everything between it nice and evenly distributed, but relaxed. And I, I'll often just almost whisper those. So instead of one E and a, two E and a, I'll go one E and a, two E and a, three E and a, four E and a. So I'm really just focusing on those strong beats. So using this chart, we can generate all sorts of different counts and rhythms. You need to be able to talk through this chart in loads of different ways. So you need to be able to read through it from top to bottom and feel those subdivisions shifting from one row to the next. You wanna be able to do it backwards, forwards. You wanna make sure you can do it in different orders. So you may go diagonally like this. One, two, and three per look, four e and a one, two, and three per look, four e and a one e and a two per look, three and four. That sort of thing, so I went across and then back. Uh, zigzags, all sorts of different combinations, random cells from each number. And you need to be able to move through this in any order because of course, that's the way we see rhythms in real life. They're not just all the same. Although obviously in certain genres like bebop, we often get long runs of half beat notes. So make sure you can say this chart in any order. 
Now, rhythmic accuracy doesn't mean robotic or metronomic. So Matheny mentioned that it's good to play to a metronome, a drum machine or a sequencer, but it's even better to play with real musicians. Groove and feel and swing is more interested in how the subdivisions are divided. Robotically and metronomically, they would be divided absolutely perfectly, absolutely evenly. But as humans, we don't do it that way. We accent some more than others, some get a tiny bit longer and some get a tiny bit less. So rhythmic accuracy is really how well you are locked in with the other musicians and with the timing expectations of the genre, not the timing expectations of a calculator. So a great way to use this chart to work on groove and feel in the practice room is to recite it along with recordings whose groove and feel you admire. The recording becomes a groove reference and you try and say those triplets or those semiquavers or those halfbeat notes, whatever it is, you try and speak them along to the recording with the right accents, some stronger than others, and with the right division of the subdivisions. That time between the beats is what's going to really be played with by different musicians and you try and align the way you're saying those with the way they're playing it on the recording. If you can't say it in time, you're not going to be able to play it in time. And of course the great thing about that is you can practice while you're doing the dishes or while you're in the shower. You can simply count through the chart along to a piece of music and really focus on the placement of those subdivisions and you're developing your groove, your swing, your feel, all this stuff without being anywhere near your instrument. So once you've built your confidence with this and you start to try and do this on the instrument, all that extra information that you've just learned from the recording, what the strong beats are, what the weak beats are, how the subdivisions flow and how evenly the space has been divided, you want to apply that to your right hand and your left hand as a guitarist. So with the right hand you want to work on your picking accuracy, how strong and weak your accenting is, how even those subdivisions are. So all that information you've learned you're now applying to your picking and to your strumming. You've got two ways that you need to be able to do that. With the left hand you need to work on your legato lines, getting your fingers, just the weight of the fingers alone, representing the groove that you've learned, that groove template you've taken from a recording. Strong beats, weak beats, the not perfect division of time, and you want to make sure that your coordination between the two hands lines up nicely as well. And again, left hand lines and chord movements, really moving as precisely as possible between chord voicings. If you can't do that, you need to be using simpler, smaller chord voicings. So remember that counting, rhythm, groove, feel, swing, dynamics, articulation, technique, tone, all these things are very, very closely related and they deserve your focus in the practice room. Like Matheny says, every musician at every level has a lot of work to do in this department. So use your free time to work on this stuff, doing the dishes, in the shower, in the shops. Just count along in your head and really try and extract the groove template from your favourite recordings. These elements really deserve your focus and they will elevate you beyond the players who have a more advanced harmonic language and more advanced technique. People would rather play with you because it just locks in. So let me know down below in the comments if you'd like me to expand on this introduction to counting and also let me know any counting tips and tricks that you work on in your own practice time to develop your time feel. Please do give this video a like, subscribe, ding that notification bell and share with any of your friends who can't count to four. And as always, I hope you're doing very well in getting plenty of practice in and I very much look forward to seeing you in the next one. Cheers. Roll up, roll up, let me embed a story you'll never forget. A drip, drip, a drowning in debt now. You can't buy your way out and